sanctuaries. Today, we begin with the narthex, the way in and the way out. I want you to imagine this morning that you are standing outside a place that you are longing to enter, but you don't know whether you're actually worthy to enter this place. You really want to go in there, but you don't know if you should. You're not quite sure what's on the other side. Think Lucy and C.S. Lewis as the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Whether to go through that door to the other side, or Alice, whether to go through the looking glass to the other side. Or think of the movie Sabrina, either the original version or a later version of it, where the chauffeur's, chauffeur's daughter is is climbing up into that tree and looking down on that Long Island mansion at a high society party, wondering if she could ever go to a party like that. Think about those places you'd long to enter, but wonder if you're really worthy, certain colleges, certain clubs. This morning, we look at one of those places the first sanctuary symbol, which is the narthex. And by the way, it is narthex, not northex, which people often say, thinking it's the exit out the north side of the church. No, it's narthex, which is an ancient tradition. It's an antechamber, an anteroom, a vestibule. In theaters, it's a lobby. But for the church, it is the entry it is the transition from the world to the church. It is the transition from the street to the pew. Now, most churches have a narthex, and they look a lot like ours. I've seen them all over the country and around the world. They are very similar with tables for bulletins and pamphlets. Uh, if you're up north, you will see a coat closet, and the farther north and the colder it is, the bigger the coat closet. Now, I've preached in little rural churches all over the country, and most of them don't have a narthex. They have a front step or stoop, as we sometimes call it, and the tradition there is you drive up on the lawn because there's no parking lot, and, and then the men just stay out front until the first hymn, or maybe the hymn right before the sermon, and then they come in. But there are many churches that do, do have these narthexes, and they're a little bit like the waiting room in the doctor's office, which is a, is a pretty good analogy because we are waiting to come in to enter the space of the great healer, the greatest healer of all time who will bring us peace and solace and hope for our lives. All the dictionaries offer the same explanation about the narthex, whether secular or theological or liturgical. It's a porch or a portico where the penitents who haven't quite yet joined the church come in uh, as they have been properly washed and baptized. The Old Testament passages that Lucy and I re read are pretty severe. They give you a pretty specific example of the fact that the priests are the only ones who can actually enter here. And if you look at the old Israelite temple, you will see there was a court of the Gentiles, and there was a court of women, and then men could come farther, and then only the priests could come in, and only the high priest could come into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was stored. And this is a fascinating example for us as we look at this whole experience of coming in. Now, the penitents or the catechumens had to be washed first in the early church before they could come into the actual service. They had a liturgy of the catechumens and the liturgy of the upper room, and the catechumens could not enter the liturgy of the upper room. You can see it in the catacombs in, in ancient Rome where there is this liturgy of the upper room where they celebrate the Lord's Supper. Until you have been properly washed and baptized, you cannot actually enter the main part of the church. And in some churches, it's interesting, there is a baptistry in the narthex area. So when there is a baptism, the entire congregation stands and turns backwards to see the baptism 
and then the penitent or catechumen can enter from the narthex into the sanctuary. Sometimes it has to do with proper clothing. Uh, in the passages that Lucy read, we see that they wore special linen garments to be able to come from the narthex into the main sanctuary, the main nave of the church. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever visited uh, St. Mark's Basilica in uh, the Basilica San Marcos in uh, the Piazza San Marcos in Venice. Perhaps you have visited there. Well, I was turned away because I had shorts on. I couldn't even walk into the place. And I was highly offended. I said to the man standing at the gate, I, at the door, I said, do you know who I am? He said, no, I have no idea who you are. I said, I am the senior pastor of a large church in the United States. He smiled and said, that and long pants will get you in. <laughs> See, having proper attire is important in certain situations, and this was true in the Old Testament. Also having proper intentions is very important. This is not a place for arrogance or pride. This is a place for penitence and humility. On one of my first Sundays in Dallas many years ago, I didn't realize on that particular Sunday that the choir was not going to process in, the ministers were not, they were all going to be up there and I was standing back in the narthex by myself thinking, oh my gosh, I should be up there with them and there's no procession and they were doing the announcements and I, I ran around to the back and I thought, I've got to pick out a, an inconspicuous way to enter, you know, so I'll come in at the beginning of the first hymn. And as I burst through the door, the congregation began singing, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. <laughs> this is not the way to enter a church. One should enter from the narthex with penitence and humility. Why? Because this is not a place for arrogance and pride. It is also not a place for wrong intentions or wrong-headed Intentions. I remember driving by a church in Richmond. We would drive by this same church every Sunday on our way to a different church, and there was this woman standing out front with signs, a, an angry-looking Brunhilde with her sour-faced sons and her sour-faced daughters holding signs up that said, don't come to this church. The preacher has no idea what he is talking about. Now, uh, that's probably not the first time that line has ever been used, but in this case, she had had an argument with the pastor, and, he, and she was actually protesting out front. Now, this is not a proper way to enter church, to, to come in with this idea that, that you have an agenda on a certain issue in the church. No one should enter with proper penitence and humility. If you don't enter that way, then you should be kept cooling your heels back in the narthex. Perhaps part of our problem is that we are entirely too casual about the whole idea of worship. We think of God as sort of a gentle buddy in the sky, you know, kind of a Wizard of Oz hiding a sort of impotent wizard of Oz hiding behind the organ pipes or the stained glass windows. Never see God as a sort of phantom of the opera lurking in the shadows. But the Old Testament folks always had a very severe understanding of God. They were scared half to death of God. You would always take off your shoes before you came in to a holy place. And I've preached in places around India where we all take off our shoes and our socks and we put them outside and we walk in in our bare feet onto the hard slate, the cold slate floor. No, we are called to come into God's presence because God is someone to be feared. Actually, is the Old Testament understanding. And the end of the movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, has the right idea because those who looked on the opening of the Ark of the Covenant, you remember at the end of that movie, they all died. Harrison Ford's character, Indiana Jones, and the woman who was with him looked away and they were spared. You see, this is the understanding of the Old Testament about how important it is to come with the proper posture of penitence and humility. 
Perhaps we do come to worship much too casually in our ideas about worship. We're too chatty with God, too familiar. The novelist Annie Dilder, Dillard in her book, The Holy, The Firm, says the following about our worship. The higher Christian churches come at God with this sort of air of professionalism with authority and pomp, as if they knew what they were doing, as if people in themselves, as if human beings, as creatures, were appropriate creatures to be having dealings with God. We walk through worship so blithely. But, says Dillard, if some Sunday morning God were just to blast the place to bits, it would no doubt cause the congregation to be genuinely shocked. Instead of handing out bulletins, she said, ushers should be handing out crash helmets and life preservers, and we should be fastening our seatbelts and lashing ourselves to the pews because someday the sleeping God may awake and take offense at how we are living our lives. Who among us is actually worthy to be in this place on a Sunday morning or any time, clergy included? A few weeks ago, I told you about a student I had in a course I taught at Princeton, Jeb Stewart Magruder, former Watergate defendant who had spent time in jail, and he was still wrestling with the idea of whether or not he was worthy to stand in a pulpit like this and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who among us is worthy to be in this place? Perhaps we should bring gifts you know, housewarming gifts. Back in the day when people came to visit kings or godfathers, they always brought three things, gifts, problems, and requests. And that's what we do when we come to church. In the early church, the great entrance included people bringing gifts of bread and wine to put on the table. We bring our gifts, we bring our problems, and our requests, which is what we do when we pray, the narthex is the place from which we come to bring those problems and those requests. There's a, a great Greek word, erkamai, which means both I come and I go. And that's a great word for the narthex because it is the coming and the going place. We come in here with our problems, our confusion, our worry about our lives. We are upset with the things that are happening in our lives, and we come into this place, and then we go back out into the world. Perhaps we should bring something when we come. But God says, actually, because of Jesus Christ, we can just bring ourselves just bring ourselves. And here we see the contrast between the Old Testament passages and the passage I read from the letter to the Hebrews. Because of Jesus, you can just bring yourselves. I saw a sign in a yard a while back, $200 reward, a lost female poodle. Please return it. No questions asked. Please return. You and I have made all kinds of mistakes and we wonder whether we're worthy to be here and God is saying because of Jesus, please return. This is the old story of the Scottish minister who was uh, inviting people to take the Lord's Supper and a young girl is crying in the pew as the communion comes to her. And an older gentleman leans forward and taps her on the shoulder and says, Take it, lassie, it's for sinners. Christ is the one who gives us entry into this place from the narthex into the nave. When I travel around the country and around the world and sometimes go in to visit churches in the middle of the week, I, I like to go in and just stand up in the pulpit just to see what it's like. That's what a preacher likes to do, just see what it's like. 
what it would be like to preach in that church. And I remember years ago visiting Riverside Church in New York City, that great, awesome, gothic expanse, walking down the aisle, making my way over to the pulpit, which is on that side, a massive stone pulpit where Harry Emerson Fosdick and many others have preached. And I started to go up into the pulpit, and there was a little rope across it, like no admittance here. And I thought, well, am I going to hop the rope, or what am I going to do? And I just stood there, and a janitor appeared from the side, eyeing me. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he grinned and said, go on, it's okay. Jesus, the doulos, the servant, the slave, gave up his very life, says Paul in Philippians 2, emptied himself, became a slave, became obedient unto death that we might have life. Gives us entry into this place. We should not take that lightly, dear friends. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition on Easter Eve, just before Easter begins around midnight, the tradition, whether it's Russian or Greek or whatever Orthodox tradition, is for the people to march outside the church and they come at midnight and they pound on the doors of the church and someone inside yells, who is the king of glory? And the throng yells out, the Lord of hosts, strong and mighty. And they repeat this two more times and they pound on the doors and the doors burst open and they are given entry. Why? because of Jesus Christ who gives them entry into this place, the narthex, the way in, and then gives us entry back into the world where we take the redemption that we have experienced and help God participate in the redemption of the world. So you see now, the narthex is more than just a place to greet your friends and count the offering. It's the way in and the way out because of the way, the truth, and the life, even Jesus Christ our Lord, the narthex, the way in and the way out for you and for me. God bless you all.